Uh, we heard about this topic uh, before, I think this morning uh, briefly, and uh, Cedric Benny is going to talk about uh, approximate error correction in this talk too. Thank you. So I think that uh, David stole my uh, Beamer theme because that's the red I designed myself. That's my red, anyway. Um, so actually my talk might answer some of the, some of the questions that were, that were opened by, um, by David, you will see. So what is, um, so it joined out with uh, Ognian, which is here. Uh, so what is approximate QEC and why, why should you care about it? So let me first explain a uh, restate exact quantum error correction. So one way to look at it is the following. We are given a channel E which describes the error happening to our physical system that you want to use to encode or transmit quantum information. And the goal of error correction is to find an encoding channel that called C and a decoding channel that called R such that uh, if then you let the noise happen and you correct, then you should uh, have the identity on your code. So this is exact QC because there's an equality sign here. So here I'm going to focus on uh, the easy part of this problem. So the hard part is to find a code that works. The easy part is given a code testing whether it is correctable, meaning testing whether this correction channel exists. Okay, so I will, I will always assume the code is given and only care about the, problem, the easy problem of finding whether this code is correctable. So I say it's easy because it's been solved by the need left condition that um, David talked about, which tells us easily whether or not uh, a given code is correctable for a given noise channel. Now in real life, however, uh, we can never really expect to have exactly the identity in the code. So this uh, need left condition, which is proven to be uh, necessary in the exact case, but not in the realistic case where we allow for even a very small error. Um, so that's one reason why you might want to look at this more realistic case. Of course, the other reason is also to have a control on uh, the possible, on the actual errors you're making when you do error correction. But um, let me make this point, this striking point, which is that this needle left question in, in the real world might be too, too strong, in fact. You might uh, be missing a lot of code that would actually work. So one indication that this is the case uh, is this, the following thing. So if you use the need left condition, you can prove that if you have n physical qubit, then if there's more, if there's n over four errors or more, in, independent errors and n qubit, then you cannot correct, you cannot encode any quantum information. However, this work, uh, this work showed that uh, if you allow for a very small error, which tends to zero as n goes to infinity, then you can correct almost errors. So that's a, that's a dramatic failure of the need left condition. So enough for the motivation. Uh, let me maybe mention a few past work which relates to what I will talk about. Um, so in this work, uh, they, studied, um, they studied the perturbative QC. So it's approximative, but the goal is that the idea is that the, the noise depends on a small parameter, and the goal is to find conditions for correcting it uh, up to a certain order in this small parameter. And they show that the needle conditions are actually uh, sufficient in this context. To, to, to correct to a given order if you apply it to the right uh, noise operators. I will come back to this later. Uh, in this work, it is shown that the transpose channel, which is a quantum version of the Bayesian inference channel, if you wish, uh, is, is near optimal uh, for approximate QEC if you measure the error in terms of entanglement fidelity. So I will again, in the, future, in the, the next, uh, find what this is. Uh, the transpose channel also is, uh, is an example of an exact cor error correction channel. Uh, the next talk, we'll also talk about the transpose channel, so I won't say much more about this. And uh, I want to mention so John Tyson, who gets a similar a bounds, which are similar to the one that I will, I will show using a very different techniques. So before I continue, uh, I will actually look at the problem which is much more general than uh, error correction. So again, this is error correction. Uh, finding C and R such that this is the identity, I will replace the identity by any channel M. So it's a lot more general. So the goal is uh, M and E are given, and we want to find an encoding and decoding so as to simulate M in this way. This term simulation has been used in the, in the field of uh, Shannon theory. Uh, for instance, if M is the identity, then this is just error correction. If M is a constant channel, then this is uh, trying to make a private code. 
and if m is uh, if m is um, decoherent, then this is trying to find a classical code. If m projects an algebra a factor, then this is a subsystem quantum error correction. So this is this is very general. So again, here we at look at the easy problem. So I'm given C and E. So I call C, E, I call it N because I will never separate them. And the goal is just to find, given N and M, is to find whether R exists such that R N equals M. So this is composition, right? This is mean that I do N and then R, and that should be equal just like doing M. So this is the exact version. I will first do the exact version, and then later I will do the approximate version, which will be all the same. So I will introduce some notation, uh, the post-processing order. So if, if R exists in this equation, then we say that N is more informative than N and write that n is larger than n, more informative. Uh, indeed, I'm not trying to look for an encoding. If I fixed n, this, uh, this equation is interesting in itself. It, uh, it's a situation where we have no access to the encoding, so we only have access to the decoding. And the idea is that we are trying to, uh, it's more of a physical point of view. We, uh, the channel gets us some information from some physical system we observe, and we, we can only try to, to recover as much data we can. So in a sense, this, character, this order characterizes uh, what kind of information the channels are preserving about the source. So this is what I mean by more informative. Of course, it's a partial order because some channels are not related at all in this, in this order. Also, I will say that two channels are equivalent if they are each more informative than, than the other. So in this talk, I will only care about channel up to this equivalence relation because that's about what kind of information they, uh, they transmit. So uh, David introduced the complementary channel. So one way to look at it is if your channel is given by a user interaction with an environment, which you can always do, which is a time strangulation, then uh, the output, the state of the environment as a function of your input state is uh, the complementary channel, which I will call n hat. So whenever I put a hat, that's an example of a complementary channel to, to the channel. So for instance, if n is unitary, so it preserves all information, then n hat is a constant channel. Uh, more precisely, if uh, concretely, if n hat is given by cross operators EI, then uh, one way to determine n hat is to, to see that it's dual applied on matrix element where these are a basis of your Hilbert space. Then you get this term EI dagger EJ, which is a term that enters a uh, need Laplace conditions, and that's, that's no coincidence, as we'll see. So one can prove this term. So I will. Uh, I will give an approximate version of this and I will give a proof for the approximate version to prove the exact version. So it says that uh, n is more informative than m if and only if n hat is less informative than m hat. So this is a generalization of the duality that David was talking about between the system and the environment. Uh, for instance, so this is a, a generalization of the Lapham condition. For instance, if you replace m by the identity, remember that finding whether n is more informative than n is trying to ask whether n is correctable. Because, of course, all channels are also less informative than the identity, so this is just asking whether n is uh, similar to the identity. And this says that it's true if and only if n hat is uh, less informative than the trace. Well, the trace is just a constant channel with output dimension one, so you could have any constant channel here. And of course, it's also asking whether n hat is in the same occurrence class as a trace. And uh, this, if you write it down in component, is a nil Laflamme condition. Because again, it says you can correct the channel um, if and only if the environment gets no information. That's basically what this is saying. Um, so I just rewrote the theorem here. Now, if you're trying to solve this problem, checking whether n is more informative than m, then this doesn't look easier because there are, again, two arbitrary channels. However, if m has a nice feature, like being projective, meaning that if you apply m hat twice, you get the same thing as applying it once, then we can solve the right-hand side. Uh, so I just restated what it means for n hat to be uh, less informative than m hat. So the goal is to find this r, and it turns out that we can always take r to be n hat. That always solves this problem. So. Uh, this is give a test to check whether n is more informative than m. This is just an equality, so we can compute it directly if we know n and m. And uh, this is another form of, another way of writing the nil condition in the case where m is the identity. 
more generally, an example where M is a projector is when M projects on an algebra. So whenever you have a star algebra in your Hilbert space, uh, you have a channel which projects onto it. And if that's the case, then M hat projects on the commutant. So if you don't know, it's not important, but it's just an example. Uh, so for instance, if the algebra is a, a factor, meaning that it acts only on one subsystem, then uh, this condition gives you the condition for, oops, sorry, for um, subsystem error correction. So the generalization of the Laplace condition to subsystem codes. Um, so now I'm going to go into the approximate version of this result. Uh, so first, I will have to, I want to want the affinity between channels, but first I need to define the affinity between states. So if, if I'm given two states, rho and rho prime, then to compute the fidelity, this is in the Ullmann, the Ullmann. So I, uh, I purify rho into psi and rho prime into psi prime, and then I compute uh, the um, overlap of the two states, but I maximize over all purification. So over, it's like maximizing over all unitary acting on the system that I don't care about. So this is your usual fidelity between two states, but written as a, as a circuit or as a tensor network, if you wish. Um, so to extend this to channels, so how do I compare two channels? So one way to do it is to take one state, say rho, uh, input it into both channels, and then comparing the output state with the fidelity. So this is almost what I'm doing here, except that I'm um, inputting a pure state, a prefixion of rho, I'm acting on one side with both channels, and then comparing this output with this fidelity. This is the same thing as uh, applying the fidelity to the state that you obtain with the uh, Jamaikov chiasomorphisms from the channels. This is a nice way of, of comparing the channels. You can also have a, this is a fidelity, so it's one when they are equal, uh, but you can also make a distance with them by taking the square root of one minus this. But it depends on the state, but I will fix this later. So this is an approximate version of the previous theorem I gave you. So what is this? This is trying to find a channel R so that Rn is as close as possible to M. So if M was the identity, again, that would be the problem of finding the optimal error for approximate error correction. And this is a dual, so it implies the n hat and m hat instead of n and m, so the, the complementary channel, and the maximization is over the other, other side. So the proof, that's the proof of it. Um, so that's why I introduced this uh, graphical language before. Uh, so this is a tensor network uh, which, in which basically we delete, we use the self relation to all the elements in this, in this thing. Uh, so the idea is that if you read it, you get the left-hand side, and if you read it in the other direction, you get the right-hand side. This Vn is a stand string deletion operator for n, and Vm is a stand string deletion for m. Uh, psi is a deletion of rho. And the trick here is that if you read it, if you interpret this as a left-hand side, then the maximization of a u corresponds to maximizing over the uh, prefixion of r. And this u prime comes from the definition of the fidelity. Whereas if you read it in the other direction to get the right hand side, then it is u prime, which is a perfection of r prime, and this u, which become from the definition of, uh, which comes from the definition of the fidelity. So I won't have time to spend too much time on this, but you can believe me for now. So now I'm going to get a better fidelity, which is a worst case. So I minimize the one I had before over all possible input states. So this is this is a worst case. It's better because it does not depend on the input state. Because uh, yeah, so that's. And it, it, it will turn out to, so the term is exactly the same as before. And the proof is the same, except that there's no minimization in between the two maximizations, so we have to use the minimax theorem to swap things around. Uh, notice that it's an equality, which is quite remarkable. So again, uh, what's nice with this form of the, of the theorem is that uh, we can do the same trick before if m hat is uh, a projector we can solve the dual problem. So that was the thing on the right-hand side of the equation in, in the theorem, and it's easy to prove that it is bounded, so this, this bond is trivial, this one is easy to prove using the triangle inequality uh, for the metric that corresponds to this fidelity. And of course we use our theorem to replace this by, uh, by the problem at hand of approximate uh, channel simulation. And we give a good bound because uh, there's no dimensional factors, there's nothing there, and uh, when f goes to one, then it go this goes to one as well. So 
this means that this quantity here is a good a guess for the optimal uh, value here. Uh, so, for instance, when M is the identity, so this is approximate quantum error correction, then we get this explicit form for this uh, um, guess, for this good guess. Uh, here you, you can see a tau. Tau is a, an arbitrary state. You can put whatever state you want here, and this and it will give you the same bound. The reason for this is that uh, this, uh, the, here we have the channel which is complementary to the identity, but there's a whole family of the channel. In fact, any channel which is constant is complementary to the identity. So tau is just the value of that constant channel. You can choose whatever, which one you want. The term works no matter which uh, element of the equivalence class of complementary channel you choose. We still have a limitation of a row because this is a worst case fidelity, but uh, this is a convex optimization, so it's not just numerically. So for instance, if uh, M project on a factor algebra, then this, this gives us uh, also uh, a good bound for uh, a good estimation of the optimal fidelity for approximate subsystem quantum error correction. And of course, it, gener it generalizes to all the other possibility of what M might be. So for instance, I get if M hat, if M is a trace or a constant channel, then this will solve the problem of uh, approximate private, privacy, private code, I suppose. Um, so we can even build this near optimal channel. So uh, if we found this state rho which minimizes this expression, which is convex optimization and, and call it sigma, then we can build a ch correction channel which performs as well as a bound, uh, which I write in this way. So what is this n hat n dagger sigma? It is this channel. It's, it's almost the dual, cha the dual channel, but with this sigma on both sides. Uh, we always choose a cross operator, so this is delta ij, so this is almost uh, uh, almost a dual channel. And this uh, overline, this bar here, is just a normalization, because this is not, this is a CP map, but it's not trace preserving. This is a way to take any CP map and make it trace preserving, and this is how you define this channel. Well, so this, this construction just comes out from um, a polar decomposition of some operator. This is why we get these inverses. Uh, let me just give you a small application of this, uh, of this result. So suppose we have a uh, the noise is, is a perturbative channel, so it's a function of a small parameter t. So the first order, the zeroth order is always, uh, the well, we assume that the first order is the identity channel, and then the next order always has the Lin platform. And if we just uh, take our good guess of what the optimal correction fidelity is, and we expand it as a power of t, then we get necessary and sufficient condition for correcting it to first order. And this condition is just the nil lafam condition applied to uh, the Lindblad operators, Li. And this is uh, necessary and sufficient, which, uh, well, the fact that it is sufficient is easy to prove, but the fact that it is necessary is a bit harder. Uh, this answer a question which was proposed in this paper on approximate error correction. Uh, slightly different situations of also perturbative quantum error correction is if our system interacts with an environment or a bath according to a weak Hamiltonian. So lambda is an energy, has a unit of energy and uh, gives us uh, the strength of, of the Hamiltonian. And the small parameter is lambda times t. I imagine that these operators j act on the system and the k is on the environment or on the bath. So here the noise operators have this form in the perturbative expansion in, in Epsilon. So here I'm, I can always choose them so that only the zeroth one has the identity component and the others start to order epsilon. So these guys, uh, EIs, are linear function of the noise operators G, J, or J, J, I guess. Um, whereas this, uh, this assumes that we know what the initial state of the environment is and I call it zero. And this, these are elements of a basis which include this zero. Uh, so this gives us, this tells us that uh, this channel is correctable to order epsilon square. So it's always, it turns out it's always correctable to order epsilon. We don't need to do anything. But it's ordered to, it's correctable to order epsilon square if and only if uh, the nil lifetime conditions are satisfied for these guys, these, are, these noise operators. But we don't need to apply them to E naught, to the one which has the identity component. Uh, and these conditions are not only necessary, but, uh, sufficient, but they are necessary. So uh, they are slightly weaker than the, so in this paper it was proven that these conditions are sufficient, sorry, this condition including the i equals zero are sufficient in the case where you don't even know the state of the environment. So this, if you know the state of the environment, then these slightly weaker conditions are not only necessary but sufficient. 
uh, in the tour. Questions? I guess an obvious question is, is about computational aspects of this. So if, if, you, if somebody gives you two channels, can, is it even decidable uh, whether one is dominating the other in the post-processing order? Well, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, um, well, it depends on the constant on M. So numerically, yeah, it's probably decidable because it was all fine, if it's all finite dimensional, there's no. Right, so I don't you know mentioned a special case where M is a projector. And if any of the projectors, then it's solved, so okay. it's easy to compute. Well, easy, it depends. I don't know how it scales, it depends on yes. the situation. Yes, but a general case of general, and it, does it lead to a, a convex optimization problem? Uh, well, in the, so in the exact case, yes. or, well, in the exact case, there is no optimization to do. Okay. It's just to, to check an equality. <laughs> in the approximate case, it's just a convex optimi optimization problem to do. Yes. Okay. So, so, so it is decidable then? Yes. Okay. Uh, further questions? No, if not, uh, let's thank uh, Cedric again.